Okay, guys, um, you are missing the lecture I gave on the win on Wednesday to the other class because of the holiday on Friday. So I wanted to um, catch you up. So this is a continuation of the DNA lecture we had last time we were together, and in this one we're going to focus on genes and gene regulation, <clears throat> and a little bit talk a little bit more about mutations. So just as a quick review, I want to kind of re introduce or revisit, I guess is better, the central dogma of molecular biology, which is simply to try to explain the kind of the fundamental importance of DNA and understanding the molecule of heredity, if you will. So with the central dogma of biology, basically what we're looking at is this so this issue with DNA. So we know that DNA is um, our molecule of heredity. We know that it's a double-stranded molecule made up of the the um, or, or pardon me, making the alpha helix. And we use the analogy of a spiral staircase. And so the DNA, the the rails of the ladder, if you will, or the rails of the spiral staircase are made up of sugar phosphate bonds and the rungs or the steps of the spiral staircase or ladder would be made up of bases bound together in a complementary fashion. So all of that information, all of our, or I should say all of our genetic information is contained in that DNA molecule, right? And it's in the nucleus of our cells, of course. And so when we are moving towards kind of understanding genes and gene regulation, we kind of have to think about how is it that we get that information out of the DNA and into and out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm of the cell where we can actually make some proteins, right? Because this is what this is all about. So that process of copying the DNA, you know, first duplicating a section of it and then copying it or transcribing it, if you remember this process is called transcription occurring in the nucleus, we transcribe the DNA to a messenger RNA strand. And then that messenger RNA strand leaves the nucleus and it continues on out through the nuclear pores and ultimately travels to another type of RNA, which is ribosomal RNA. And at that point, we make our proteins right at the ribosome. So we start linking these amino acids together, and that process is called translation. It's the translation of the message that was transcribed in the nucleus. So that's essentially the central dogma of biology, right? It all kind of comes down to that. So here's a picture which sort of illustrates this process starting up here in the nucleus, right? So this is our nucleus in purple, and inside here you see your double, your alpha helix, right? The double-stranded molecule, and then we see this section in the middle, you see, remember we talked about how the enzymes come in and they kind of unzip this. So we would cut, we would have copied that at one point. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take this bit of information, right, on that particular gene, if you will, and we're going to manufacture a messenger RNA strand, which is what's happening here. So this is what we're looking at. When you're taking this information and transcribing it to a messenger RNA strand, that process is referred to as um, transcription, right? And then that messenger RNA strand is going to leave. On this picture, you're also seeing something that we're going to talk about later, but I want to point it out now. You see this term called intron and exon. Introns are non-coding portions of DNA, which means they don't code for, they're not genes, right? They don't code for the production of proteins, but they are very important. And the exon is more of the coding portion. So we'll come back to that. So basically, well, actually, I'll do it while I'm here. So these non-coding portions sometimes can get clipped out, right, of the messenger RNA strand at different points in time. And then in order to get this thing ready to go, we put a put what we call a, a tail, a poly-A tail. And what you can't see here is there's a cap on the, sec on the messenger RNA strand. So we kind of like cap it off and put a tail on it and send it out into the cytoplasm of the cell, which you see happening here. And so it's going to then travel until it finds a um, ribosome, right? Ribosomes have two subunits, and they're shown here, but you can see the whole ribosome together there. And that messenger RNA strand is going to run through 
this ribosome between these two subunits and it's going to run through and then you see there's these three binding sites the A, the P, and the E binding site. I talked about those in class. So what's going to happen is as it gets read through here when it gets to a start codon it's going to start assembling a protein, right? Again this process is called translation. So we see these little kind of greenish structures. This is transfer RNA. So we see the codons. Remember the codons are the three three base sequences and that codon is going to um, basically correspond to the anti-codon on the transfer RNA and it's going to tell the transfer RNA what kind of amino acid that we need. Remember we talked about um, the how to do that we did it in the lab where you use that chart, and so we you started with your first base, your second base, and your third base, which would correspond to a specific amino acid. And in some cases, more than one codon will code for the same amino acid, so there's a fair amount of redundancy there. There's only 24 amino acids total options. But what you see here is this, so this codon would, this anti-codon and the codon would sort of adhere together, and then we've got our amino acid. And then it would pass on to this one, and then we would add a new one here, right? And so as it passes on, the amino acids start to bind together, and we make this big, long polypeptide chain until we get to a stop codon, at which point we would stop copying. copying pardon me. So that's the process of translation. And then, you know, the, so what we're seeing here in purple, this is this growing protein, right? It can be 10 amino acids, it can be 10,000, it depends on the protein. You can see the amino acids are just floating around in the cytoplasm, right? They're there, um, and you can see your transfer RNA. Uh, there's one more thing I want to say, and I want to go back here. I met, forgot to mention this enzyme, RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is the enzyme that's responsible for the copying of the information from the DNA to the RNA, the assembling of the messenger RNA um, bases in sequence in a complementary way. If you recall, we have four bases for DNA. Um, one is adenine, one is thymine, those always bind together, and the other one is cytosine, and the fourth is guanine, and the cytosine and the guanine always bind together on a DNA strand. When we start to assemble our messenger RNA or our RNA strand, we have also four bases. All three of them are the same, with the exception of um, thymine is substituted for uracil. So uracil is the unique base in messenger in, in an RNA strand. Okay, so that's kind of a review of what we talked about in our last lecture. So what we want to do now is just kind of revisit this concept of what a gene actually is. And, you know, it's been a kind of an interesting progression of trying to figure out a definition for what a gene actually is. You know, um, so historically, you know, we're trying to kind of figure out like what it is about heredity and what is it, where's this information carried? Is a gene a little bit of DNA? Is it something that produces a protein? Um, what if we have one protein that's made of different genes? So we have a lot of this going on. You know, first they thought it was just something that coded for the production of enzymes, which are of course proteins, but then we saw other proteins that weren't enzymes, so then it was like, well, maybe it's just a gene is something that codes for a protein. But then we have certain things that are made up of more than one protein, so it started to get kind of confusing. So um, as we kind of wrap up the genome study, what we think would be more clear in terms of like what a pro what a gene actually is is actually gotten quite a bit more confusing. So we don't even with the mapping of the human genome, we don't still have a good definition for what a protein or what a gene is. Pardon me. So for now, what we can agree on is that a gene is a discrete unit of hereditary information that consists of a specific nucleotide, nucleotide sequence in DNA. So again, it's a discrete unit of heritable information consisting of a very unique nucleotide sequence in the DNA. So that's what a gene is. And of course, we know we have genes that code for all kinds of traits and all kinds of proteins. So there's a lot of different options. We talked about that last week as well. And, you know, so the question is, are we our genes or is it more than that? And what we've learned, especially after wrapping up this human genome sequence and, you know, kind of like getting a little bit more involved in this, we 
agree now scientists agree that we it's a combination of this sort of complex interplay between our genes and our environment and that ultimately affects our phenotype or what we present right so all kinds of things can influence this between physical factors environmental factors behavioral traits all of that can be can influence our gene right so it's both and it's interesting so what we want to kind of figure out is like how is it that our cells know what kind of proteins to make, right? If every cell has the exact same genetic information, meaning the DNA in all our cells is exactly identical, then how is it that some cells, you know, like a liver cell will produce enzymes and they'll pr produce, you know, lipoproteins, whereas a brain cell is doing something different, maybe releasing neurotransmitters and the stomach cell is secreting, you know, um, hydrochloric acid or something along those, along those lines. Like how is it that a cell knows what to do? How do they know? How, if it's got all the same information, right? So it stands to reason that there's got to be some way that our DNA is sort of signaled or controlled in such a way that will tell each cell what it needs to make, what kind of protein it needs to make. And that's where we're going with this. So here's one way that cells can communicate with one another and ultimately affect control, pardon me, gene expression. So in our picture, we see two cells. We see this cell here. The cell is going to want, be the one that generates and sends the message. So that message is going to leave, and it's going to signal this receiving cell. Or this, this receiving cell is going to receive the signal, right? And so it's this like transfer of information via the signaling molecule. So signaling molecules are sometimes called cytokines. You know, there's all kinds of different signaling molecules. Hormones are signaling molecules, neurotransmitters, all of those things act as signaling molecules. So this ability for cell-to-cell -cell signaling is critical, right? It's super important. Um, so again, what we're seeing is the molecules, signalers are gonna exit one cell and they're gonna bind to a receptor on the outside of another cell. And that process of one cell secreting a signal and the other cell receiving the signal is called signal transduction. And that term kind of comes up a lot. Signal transduction is a broad term that we use to um, discuss or explain how a message is transmitted from one cell to another. So on this picture, we see it in a little bit more detail. We don't see the cell that's um, generating the signal, but we see the signaling molecule. So here it is. And the way that this signaling molecule, so it's this signaling molecule that's ultimately going to affect what happens in the DNA. But the signaling molecule isn't going to be the thing that, you know, basically tells the the, nucle the DNA what part to copy. But what happens is the signaling molecule is going to bind a receptor. In this case, the receptor is on the surface of the cell. Depending on the signaler, sometimes the receptor molecule can be in the cytoplasm, some kind of, sometimes it can be in the nucleus, but it's got to be somewhere. So in this case, we have a signaling molecule that doesn't come into the surface of the cell. It's probably water-soluble and not fat-soluble. So it binds this receptor right here. This then sets off a series of events, kind of it's like a relay, like this receptor is a protein, it signals this protein and this one, and then this one, right? So there's a series of events that can be kind of complex, but the important thing is that basically we're activating these proteins until we finally get to the terminal protein, the one at the end of this sort of cascade, and that activated protein then is going to actually go into the nucleus. Sometimes it's already going to be in the nucleus. It depends. But it's going to go into the nucleus, and it's going to travel to one specific section of DNA. And it's going to basically be the impetus for the gene regulation, right? It's essentially going to turn on or turn off that section of DNA, right? So if it turns on that section of DNA or turns off, what it's ultimately going to do is it's going to alter the message, right? It's going to decide what part of this new, this DNA strand we're going to copy. So it's going to travel to a specific portion of that DNA, un, you know, and then sort of start off that whole process we talked about, unzipping the DNA, copying it, transcribing it to the messenger RNA, 
and then that transcribed messenger RNA is going to leave and it's going to ultimately go to a ribosome and it's going to be responsible for the formation of a new protein, right? And the protein that's made is the the reason why this particular protein is made in the scenario is is a, re, is a result of that signaler, right? So that's the deal, right? It's really kind of complex and intricate, but it's an example of signal transduction and more specifically like the details in terms of signal transduction in that receiving cell. But then what the biggest question I think is what controls whether the, at this level, what controls this, this activated protein? What controls whether something is turned on and turned off? So it turns out that there's more to it, of course. So the more to it, the kind of the most simple way to think about it is by understanding something called a promoter and an, and an enhancer. Both promoters and enhancers are in front of the DNA's the gene DNA sequence that ultimately needs to be transcribed. So essentially what promoters and enhancers do is they help regulate transcription. So let me give you a definition quickly and then we'll come, I'll just explain that picture to you. So a promoter is simply a region of DNA that initiates the transcription of a particular gene. So it essentially says, okay, this is the one we want to copy. An enhancer is also a region of DNA that can be bound by proteins to increase the likelihood that transcription of a gene will take place. So it sort of enhances the likelihood that we're gonna actually copy that bit of gene. Enhancers sometimes are called transcription factors as well. And so you can see below that green box there that these transcription factors actually bind to the promoter, right? And they essentially turn on or turn off transcription. So in this picture, what we're looking at here is two animals, in fetal animals. One is a chicken and the other one is a mouse. The gene that we're looking at is shared by both the chicken and the mouse, and it's this Hox C8 gene. So essentially, what these promoters and then these enhancers do is, in this case, the promoter <clears throat> promotes, the enhancer binds, is you know, is part of the DNA and ahead of where that gene actually is located. And the promoter is going to bind and it's going to essentially, um, in this case, kind of turn down the transcription rate. So it's going to turn down the rate of copying, if you will, this particular gene. You can see our, D our enzyme here, RNA polymerase, which is responsible for the transcription. And we see in this case that we have a because we've turned down transcription, we're going to have a low transcription rate. And in this case, this particular gene, the Hox C8 gene, is coding for the thoracic spine. So in the chicken, we see we end up because of this event, these events, we end up with a chicken that has only seven thoracic vertebrae. Versus with a mouse, the promoter and the enhancer, you see, it's a little bit different. And what's happening here is it's causing an increase in transcription rate because the proteins of the um, enhancers are kind of aligning better with the with the transcription complex. The transcription complex is sort of a collaboration between the promoter and the RNA polymerase and the bit of the gene that we're trying to ultimately transcribe. So in this case, we're getting higher transcription rate. So what we see in this, as a result of that is you see more thoracic vertebrae being formed. So in this case of the mouse, we have seven thoracic vertebrae, right? So it's the same gene both coding for the same trait, which in this case is thoracic vertebrae, but one is turned up and the other one is turned down. And so as a result, we see a different phenotype, if you will, a different presentation of the thoracic spine. So those are promoters and enhancers. But then we have to kind of figure out like how do we, how, when and how much protein actually needs to be made. Obviously, we're not just making protein randomly all the time because it's way too expensive energetically. So cells can save a bunch of energy by not making extra stuff they don't need, which should make sense to us, right? So what we know about trans gene regulation is it essentially causes pr proteins to be made only when they're needed, right? And not all the time just randomly making protein all the time. It's just too expensive. All right, so... We kind of, so now we know that genes don't just randomly start making proteins. They are told to do it. They are told the cells are stimulated by signaling molecules, which ultimately 
assist in this promoter and enhancer thing, turning on or turning off transcription factors at the DNA. Both the promoters and the enhancers are found on the DNA. That's kind of an important thing to remember. Um, so now that we know we have genes and we have regulation of genes, the question is like, what does it? What does the number of genes really mean? Like, we're trying to figure out like what? How do we explain the difference from organism to organism? Like, let's say the difference between a human and a um, plant, or a human and a mouse, or something like that. Does the complexity of the organism equal the the number of genes? So does it mean that? If we have a greater number of genes, do we actually have a more complex organism? And that seems kind of reasonable, right? You think like, yeah, something like a human who is super complex and has like all this higher functioning as compared to even like a, a monkey, for example. Like you think one, obviously the human is more complex, so we think must be because it has more genes. Well, it turns out that isn't the case at all. So here's a couple of examples. Um, we have different species. We have four living and one non-living thing. Um, the first is a virus that of course is not alive. We've talked about that before. And you see that this virus has 170,000 base pairs as compared to the E. coli bacteria, which is a pretty ubiquitous um, bacteria. Uh, and a B E. coli bacteria has 4.6 million base pairs. And then we have a fruit fly with 130 million base pairs. So we're going up with our base pairs and so far we're still getting more complex. So our, our thought that yeah, um, more genes equals a more complex organism is still holding kind of true. We get to the human right there, 3.2 billion base pairs. But then we have the most, the, the organism with the highest number of genes, which is a canopy plant, 150 billion base pairs. Now the canopy plant is not more complex than a human organism in terms of functionality. So that we sort of just lost our, our, our argument there, right? So it turns out it's not the number of genes that makes something more complex. It's the number of coding genes that did that. that <clears throat> um, so it's, pardon me, it's the number of non-coding genes, which we're going to get to next. So what evidence is showing us is that the number of coding genes, genes that are actually coding for a particular protein, that doesn't determine our complexity, right? Instead, it's the number of the non, the, the amount, I should say, probably, of the non-coding stuff. So if you recall that very, that picture I showed you a few slides back, I pointed out to you the introns and the exons. The introns essentially is the stuff that gets cut out of the gene, right? So it's the non-coding portion. So ultimately, it's like if you imagine kind of having a ribbon and you'd like cut out a section of the ribbon, you'd cut out the intron. So it's non-coding. Um, and up until, well, actually still, but we, we didn't understand that those in that in those introns actually are the key to the whole thing, right? So much so that the introns got sort of, um, named junk DNA. So this junk or this trash DNA, essentially, we just thought it was sort of extra. I don't know, you know, there's not a lot of extra stuff around in the nucleus, but it didn't seem, we didn't really get it, but it turns out that it's that non-coding or that junk DNA that actually regulates the DNA. So remember, this is all about gene regulation and we're trying to figure out like, how is it that some genes get copied and some don't, some get transcribed faster, some get transcribed slower. What is, what's in charge of that? And it turns out that it's just that, it's that non-coding information, those introns or the non, um, our junk DNA, pardon me. So this picture I found somewhere, and it's talking about how many genes are conserved with humans. So a mouse, or pardon me, a chimp, sorry, is about, this says 99.5%. I actually was told it was 90, we're like 98%. Um, we share 98% of our DNA with a, with a chimp. Pansy. We share 88% of our DNA with a mouse, 75% of our DNA with a chicken, and 60% of our DNA with a fruit with a fruit fly. Also, if you were comparing, if you were to compare one human to another, all humans are basically 99.5% similar to others genetically in terms of coding DNA. 
So that is kind of a head scratcher. It's like, why is it that if it's only 0.5% difference, why do we see so much variability? And kind of the same, like what's the story with a chimp, right? If 98% of our DNA is identical to a chimpanzee, and we're obviously a lot more functional, much more higher, highly functioning animals, what's, where's the meat? You know, what's the story in that whole scenario? And it turns out, that it's the 2% that's different. It's not very much, but the 2% is essential. The 2% of our non-coding DNA, right? That's what it is, is these non-coding proteins that are gene regulators. That's where the rubber meets the road, right? That's what regulates the rest of it. So it's super interesting. So essentially what I'm saying is our genes are regulated by our non-coding DNA or our junk DNA. You're gonna watch a video that's posted in the um, in, on Canvas as an extra credit assignment that's all about this and I'll tell you more in the end of this presentation. So we talked about mutations in lab last week and, and in lecture and so muta a mutation is different than, a, and than gene regulation. Um, a mutation usually is referring to something, some dysfunction in this transcription translation, you know, between the DNA and the RNA, right? You see a code on here, and you see it coding for glutamate, normal. Then we see the same down here. We see our, uh, we see a, a substitution of an adenine for a thymine, which is then coding for a different amino acid, right? So that would be a mutation. A mutation is any change in the nucleotide sequence of DNA. So, turns out that each human has on average 60 new mutations compared to their parents. So it's like we're constantly seeing these mutations pop up, right? So um, once a gene has mutated, right, then if, it, if that mutated gene gets copied, then that now becomes heritable, right? So it's like this potentially heritable situation where we get these mutations that can change the message, the protein. It depends on the change, right? So in terms of what's going to happen to the protein, well, it just sort of depends on what the sub, what, what exactly is being substituted, right, or deleted or whatever. So we talked about this in the lab, and I just have an example here um, with what happens if we just change a letter. And so I used in this example sentence with all three letter words because we have, because codons have three letters. So in this case, our sentence, and remember we only have so many letters to work with, so in this case the sentence is the cat ate the rat, right? Five three letter words or five codons, right? Stringing together to produce, in this case, a sentence, just like amino acids would string together to produce a protein. So that protein, if you will, makes sense. The cat ate the rat, right? We get it. So if we were to change one letter and the letter we were to change was this R right here from an R to an H, now we say have the cat ate the hat. has very different meaning, but it's still understandable. So that would be referred to as a substitution. We're substituting one letter for another. Sometimes, because of the nature of amino acids and because there is some redundancy, if you get lucky, sometimes you might change one letter for another and actually codes for the same amino acid. So it doesn't change the protein at all. That would be ideal. But that's not always the case. Um, here's another example of a different type of mutation. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take out this C. We delete this C, and the whole thing's going to shift to the left. That's referred to as a frame shift. So if we were to delete this C, it would be a deletion that causes a frame shift that's going to make everything move over, and now the result is not sensible. Right? It's insensible. It's missense. It doesn't make any sense at all. Right? It doesn't have any of the same meaning, nor does it even have the same number of letters at the, you know, where now we've only got five words, three of them have, uh, we have five words, but three of them, four of them, part of me, have three letters, and one of them has only two, so that's not going to work. And here's another example of an insertion of a letter. So what we're doing here is we're inserting a B after the sixth letter. So, oops, where are we? One, two, three, four, five, six. So, we're inserting an extra letter, so we're just going to slide a B right in there, right? And again, still not working. We've got an extra, we still have five words with three letters. They don't mean the same thing. They don't look the same thing. The sentence doesn't mean the same thing. It's not even close, and there's an extra letter at the end.
So each, each mutation in this example changed the meaning of the sentence. One, we still had a sentence that was decipherable, but the rest of it was just completely you know, garbled nonsense, didn't make any sense at all. So those things we were just explaining, when you change one base, is called a point mutation. So this is what I was telling you would be ideal, the ideal situation. If we substitute in this case a guanine for an adenine, we would still code for the same protein because these UGU and UGC both code for cysteine. But when we start doing other things, right, we change the amino acid completely. This, this putting a T instead of an A cause, codes for a different protein, and putting a T instead of a A here calls for a stop protein. So mutations are gonna, the key, the thing to remember is mutations occur at a single nucleotide and they have variable effects, right? So here's um, what a frame shift is. I used the term before. So a frame shift mutation basically has gotta be due to an insertion or a deletion of a nucleotide and it's gonna cause dif different at the very best or totally defective proteins. So you can see that there as an example. All right, so some things that we know can cause DNA to mutate. So these are mutagens. Um, and so in, these are things that we find in our environment, like re ionizing radiation. Um, we can see smoking does it. Um, this would be uh, trans fats can do it. Sugar can do it. UV light can do it. Um, different chemicals. There's all kinds of environmental toxins that are referred to as mutagens. Sometimes just it, mutations can happen spontaneously, right? Not necessarily due to a known mutagen. But these are things that we know cause DNA mutation. And once that DNA is mutated and it gets copied, then those that copied mutation will continue to persist in gen, from generation to generation. You know, um, mutations aren't always bad when we start to talk about evolution after your exam we'll see that evolution is due to spontaneous mutations over time right so it's changing traits or genes over time in most cases to make something more adaptable to its environment you know and if it and if the organism can't adapt then it tends to die off so Evolution is a process of mutation from generation to generation, right? It's evidence of mutations, I guess you could say, from generation to generation. Um, so they're not always deleterious, right? They can be advantageous. It sort of all depends. But the key is that once that DNA changes, if the DNA is copied, it copies that change. Um, I was going to say one other thing, and I'm just forgetting what it was. All right. Um, so I want to finish with this last slide, which is an introduction into epigenetics. So epigenetics is essentially a variation in the tags, the chemical tags. So really what I'm talking about there are the promoters and, in the, and the enhancers that attach to a D and they affect how a gene is read. So mutations, we kind of think about it in a larger context, you know, affecting how the entire DNA molecule potentially is read and or um, copied. But with epigenetics, we're seeing a variation in how those promoter and enhancers attach to the DNA, and then that will affect how the gene is actually read, maybe turning on or off transcription factors or increasing or, or decreasing the rate of transcription. So that's what we're thinking about when we think about epigenetics. And <clears throat> where epigenetics really gets important is that some alleles, and also, it, it, or I was going to say, the um, epigenetic state. So if an allele is affected by epigenetics, meaning that it's going to change the way the DNA ultimately gets read, which means it's going to change the protein that gets produced, um, what we know about those is that those alleles with this epigenetic um, factor, if you will, and also the associated phenotype with those particular alleles. Remember, phenotype is what you present. You have two alleles for every trait, and phenotype is what we see. What we see is that this epigenetic state can be inherited across 
generations and it can affect the protein production down the line from generation to generation. And this slide at the bottom of this slide here is something I found that kind of tries to explain this a little bit. And so what it's looking at is the effects of maternal obesity, you know, so inflammation, insulin resistance, an increase in the breakdown of fat, an increase in the production of lipoproteins, um, that can affect the fetus. So the mom's in this case, nutritional state or this overnutrition in her inflammatory state, her insulin resistant state can affect the fetus and it can reprogram the fetus's genes towards fetal inflammation, right? And so you can see that fetal inflammation potentially is affecting the baby's fetal li liver, which is causing a change in the production of liver fats, altering maybe the sensitivity of skeletal muscle, brain tissue, adipose, fat tissue, adipose tissue, and the pancreas, which then is going to set that person up for disease. So the exposure was the, the fetus was exposed to the mom's genes in utero. The mom's genes were mutated, or mom's genes were being mult, um, uh, modified epigenetically, which then affected the developing fetus, which then sets this kid up for childhood disease. In this case, this is like insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes type 2, those kinds of things. So this kid is at an increased risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, insulin resistance, which is like prediabetes, which causes all lots of issues, including inflammation, obesity. Um, in this case, where hyperphagia means um, overeating, a really hungry, uh, and also diabetes. So what we're saying is epigenetic factors and epigenetic factors, this is what the video that you're going to watch is all about epigenetics and what does it mean and what affects, what are epigenetic factors. Um, but we see that epigenetic factors, it's these epigenetic factors that are kind of the way in between the environment and the genes, right? So epigenetics means essentially above the genome, right? And so it's all these things that are outside of the genetic, the DNA, right, outside of the nucleus and outside of the person in many cases that actually can alter gene regulation and ultimately protein production. So that's called epigenetics. So in your file for weeks 11, pardon me, same file where this video is, you're going to find in the media and resources file, you're going to find a little short, like 35 minute video on epigenetics. Um, I would encourage you to watch it. It's pretty interesting. And then if you go to, I think where you'll find it is if you go to your grades tab and you scroll down to the extra credit portion, you'll see there's an extra credit, epigenetics extra credit. If you click on that, you'll see a prompt and then a place for you to write in your answer. So it's like an essay as, uh, that, that takes some of the information out of the video that you're gonna watch and it um, you're gonna do that actually on Canvas. So you type in that box and you'll submit it to me. It's extra credit, it's worth 10 potential extra credit points and it's due um, Friday the, I believe it's the 18th. Let me look at my calendar really quick. It's the day that we come back to class and have our test. Yeah, Friday the 18th, November 18th. So any questions about any of it, send me an email and we will um, get there. So also, sorry, also in that uh, week 11 module in the study resources folder, there's the last little bit of your study guide for your exam that covers the stuff we did last week in class, the DNA stuff that might, may, or not been on, may or may not have been on our previous study guide, and also a few questions about this presentation. So take a look at that as well. Okay, have a great holiday. We'll see you guys in class in a week.